Income tax 2021-2022, residential rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of dwelling part number three. Get ready to get refunds to the max diving into income tax 2021-2022. Most of this information can be found in Publication 527, Residential Rental Property Tax Year 2021 on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, Income Tax Formula, looking at Line 1, Income, although we would have another schedule, basically an income statement with income and expenses, expenses basically being deductions. The net then is what rolls into Line 1, Income on the Income Tax Formula, as well as eventually Page 1 of the Form 10. And 40. This is the Schedule E, the Supplemental Income and Laws. We're looking at the rental real estate information. This is basically the income statement form that we're considering. Points. The term points is often used to describe some of the charges paid or treated as paid by a borrower to take out a loan or a mortgage. These charges are also called loan origination fees, maximum loan charges, or premium charges. So when we're thinking about points, we have to think about what the points are being applied to. Are they being applied to charges? Or are they being applied to basically interest? And if they're interest, they're possibly going to be prepaid interest. So any of these charges, points that are solely for the use of money are interest. So if the charges are for using money, basically the rent on money is interest. Because points are prepaid interest, you generally can't deduct the full amount in the year paid, but must deduct the interest over the term of the loan. So if you're talking about interest, we're talking about basically the rent on the purchasing power of the money, in essence. And if we have prepaid interest, that's kind of like prepaid rent. We paid for it. You know, we got the in we paid for the interest before we actually, you know, used the money in this case. So that means that you might have to allocate it then over basically the life of the loan to allocate it to the time frame that's actually being kind of used for the interest. So the method used to figure the amount of points you can deduct each year follows the original issue discount or the OID rules. In this case, points are equivalent to OID, which is the difference between the amount borrowed, redemption price at maturity or principal, and the proceeds, the issue price. So the first step is to determine whether your total OID, which you may have on bonds or other investments in addition to the mortgage loan, including the OID resulting from the points, is insig insignificant or de minimis. So if it's insignificant or de minimis, or you could think of it possibly as immaterial basically to the decision making or, or you know, a fairly small amount in relation, then, which it oftentimes would be, you might be able to use a more simplified method such as like a straight line kind of method. If the OID isn't de minimis, it's fairly significant, then uh, you must use the constant yield method to figure how much you can deduct. Constant yield method, that, that's a little bit more complicated because the rate could then change uh, as, as time goes, kind of like on an on a adjustable loan. So it gets a little bit more complex. A straight line method would be the easier thing to do, but not exactly... Uh, the the pro not exactly proper right it would be the easier but less exactly proper thing to do so points de minimis oid the oid is the de minimis if it is less than one fourth of one percent or 0 0.0025 of the stated redemption price at maturity principal amount of the loan multiplied by the number of full years from the date of original issue to maturity the the term of the loan if the OID is de minimis, you can choose one of the following ways to figure the amounts of points uh, you can deduct each year. So the easier methods, if the loan is fairly, if it's fairly small, the points, then you might be able to use an easier method such as on a constant yield basis over the term of the loan, on a straight line basis over the term of the loan in proportion to the stated interest payments in its entirety at the maturity of the loan. So you make this choice by deducting the OID points in a manner consistent with the method chosen on your timely filed tax return for the tax year in which the loan is issued. So obviously when the loan is originally issued, you got to go through the closing statement and kind of look, look up all this stuff in terms of the points and the points on the statement and whether or not those are being reported on uh, the, the interest statement as well, determine the deductibility of it and then if you have to basically allocate the points because they're prepayments 
uh, determine the method that you're allowed to use and the method that, that, that you are going to choose to use at that point. And then you'll establish that method by using it on that first year. And then after that, it should be fairly straightforward going, going forward once you set up uh, the routine. Obviously, that's the biggest problem or pain is doing that in the initial year to get everything lined up. So example, uh, Carol took out a 100,000 mortgage loan on January 1st, 2021 to buy a house she will use as a rental during 2021. The loan is to be repaid over 30 years. During 2021, Carol paid 10,000 of mortgage interest, stated interest to the lender. When the loan was made, uh, she paid 1,500 in points to the lender. So the points reduced the principal amount of the loan from 100,000 to 98,500, resulting in a 1,500 OID. Uh, Carol determines that the points, the OID she paid are de minimis based on the following computation. So we had the redemption price um, at maturity, the principal amount of the loan, 100,000 multiplied by the term of the loan in complete years. It's a 30 year loan multiplied by that rate that they gave us, which was, uh, you know, 25% of a point point oh oh two five. So the de minimis amount would be the 7,500, 7,500. So the points, the OID she paid 1,500 are less than the de minimis amount of 7,500. Therefore, Carol has a de minimis OID and she can choose one of the four ways discussed earlier to figure the amount she can deduct each year, like a straight line method, right? And a fairly easy method. She could take that amount and say, I'm going to deduct each year. Now, notice no matter what you do, the fact that you have to basically allocate it over the 30 years is kind of a negative because you get the deduction. But uh, if you have to allocate it, if you have to allocate it over a 30 year period, you're going to get a fairly small amount of the 1,500 uh, over 30 years, no matter how you, how you, no matter how you account for it, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be the, the nicest thing. So it's nice. The easier thing you would think would be the appropriate thing to do like a straight line method in the event uh, that it's a small amount and basically de minimis uh, to the overall decision making. That would be the general idea. So under the straight line method, she can deduct $50 each year for 30 years. So that would be like the easiest thing to do usually. Constant yield method. If the OID isn't de minimis, you must use the constant yield method to figure how much you can deduct each year. You figure your deduction for the first year in the following manner. Number one, determine the issue price of the loan. If you paid points on the loan, the issue price is generally the difference between the principal and the points. Number two, multiply the result in one by the yield to maturity defined later. And number three, subtract any qualified stated interest payments defined later from the result in two. This is the OID you can deduct in the first year. So yield to maturity, the YTM, this rate is generally shown in the literature you receive from your lender. It's the literature. It's like classic literature that you get from, I would call it documentation or something, but no, it's literature. It's like a fine text. Any case, if you don't have this information, consult your lender or tax advisor. In general, the YTM is the discount rate that when used uh, in computing the present value of all principal and interest payments produces an amount equal to the principal amount of the loan. Qualified, qualified stated interest, the QSI in general, this is the stated interest that is unconditionally payable in cash or property other than another loan of the issuer at least annually over the term of the loan at a fixed rate. So here's an example, example year one. The facts are the same as in the previous example. Uh, example, the YTM on Carol's loan is uh, 10.2467 compounded annually. She figured the amount of points, the OID she could deduct in 2021 as follows. So she's got the principal amount of the loan, the 100,000 minus uh, the points, the, the OID, the 1,500, that gives us the issue price of the loan, 98,500 multiplied by the YTM, that uh, rate that we have up top gives us the total of 10,093 minus the QSI of the 10,000 gives us the points of uh, the deductible amount of the 93. Notice either method 
it's still you know a relatively small amount <laughs> I, I on either method because because again you're still gonna have to allocate it over the life of the loan but now you've got to allocate it in a way where the the rate's going to change per frame per year and it gets a, it's a little bit more complex to do than like a straight line method which would be the easy thing to do so to figure your deduction in any subsequent year you start with the adjusted issue price to get the adjusted issue price add to the issue price figure in year one any oid previously deducted then follow steps two and three earlier so example for year two Carol figured the deduction for 2022 as follows. She had the issue price, 98,500 plus points, the OID deducted in 2021 at the 93. That's what we got to last time. The adjusted issue price is the 98,593 multiplied by the YTM. That's the, you know, 0.102467. And that gives us the 10,103 minus the qsi which is the 10,000, and so now in the next year 2022 we've got 103 which is different than the last year which was 93 which is pretty small difference like why does it matter why can't we just do a straight line you might say well in this in her case she might have been able to because it's it was de minimis which would be the reasonable thing to do you would think unless this was significant uh in which case you got to do the more exact method so loaner mortgage ends if your loan or mortgage ends, you may be able to deduct any remaining points OID in the tax year in which the loan or mortgage ends. So you might say, okay, well, what if I do this points thing and I'm deducting these points over the, over the life and then, but then the loan or the mortgage ends for whatever reason. Well, then you would think that you would get the benefit of, of the remaining points that haven't been taken at that point so if your loan or mortgage ends you may be able to deduct any remaining points in the tax year in which the loan or mortgage ends a loan or mortgage may end due to refinancing so you might say i'm, I'm taking out a new loan what about these points that, I'm, that are still hanging on there for the next for another 20 years well then you might be able to take those at that time so prepayment foreclosure or similar event however if the refinancing is with the same lender the remaining points the oid generally aren't deductible in the year in which the refinancing occurs but may be deductible over the term of the new mortgage of the loan so again if now if you refinance with the same lender you can't really refinance like just to take the points earlier so if it's the re if it's the same lender you might have to then take those points and allocate them over the term of the new loan which would be not good so points uh when loan uh, refinance is more than the previous outstanding balance you refinance a rental property for more than the previous outstanding balance the portion of the points allocate allocable to loan proceeds not related to rental uh, use generally can't be deducted as rental expense example charles refinanced a loan with a balance of 100,000. The amount of the new loan was 120,000. Charles used the additional 20,000 to purchase a car. That's interesting. So it gets kind of tricky. Well, in any case, the uh, the points allocable to the 20,000 would be treated as non-deductible personal interest. So it gets kind of, so, you know, obviously once you take out, you know, a loan with the home as collateral and then you use it for something other than the home, it complicates, you know, it's going to complicate things. So now you got a business property thing but you took out the loan that you had and used the business property as collateral to buy a car, which we're presuming is not the business property. So in any case, so repairs and improvements generally an expense for repairing or maintaining your rental property may be deducted if you aren't required to capitalize the expense. So now you got the repairs and the improvements. And the question there is, is this a re something a repair which i can deduct this year or an improvement which i have to capitalize and possibly then deduct over multiple years in the future unless i can get like an accelerated deduction like a 179 or special deduction so usually you want to be categorizing it in repairs to get the benefit up front and examples would be like if i like repaired my roof if i repaired my roof then it's a repair even though it can be quite expensive you would think but what if i put a whole new roof up there now it sounds like an improvement so what if i leave like one shingle of my old roof and then i put all the other shingles i replace them is that like a repair or an improvement you get these kind of sticky mid areas of people of course wanting to categorize more likely in a repair and you can find and so there's a lot of uh you know 
you want to you want to try to categorize that as best you can so improvements you must capitalize any expense you pay to improve your rental property an expense is for an improvement if it results in the betterment to your property restores your property or adopts your property to a new or different use so let's go through that again because this is going to be important right if i have a if my roof got a hole in it and i've fixed the hole in my roof you would think that would be that would be just putting it back to its normal use right but if i put a whole new roof on it then you would think maybe now it's improving the roof especially if it was like a fancy kind of like it well in any case so so that's the question so let's see so it results in betterment to your property so your property has been betterment i'm, I'm see, that's a not the most specific term right there restores your property so it wasn't it wasn't up to condition it, it restores it but not i guess to the normal use which would be kind of like a repair adopts your property to a new or different use so obviously if you if you do something that's changing the whole perspective of your property then that would be an improvement you would think so betterments so expenses that may result in a betterment to your property include expenses for fixing pre-existing defect or or condition enlarging or expanding your property or increasing the capacity strength or quality of your property restoration expenses that may be for restoration include expenses for replacing a substantial structure part of your property repairing damage to your property after uh, after you properly adjusted the basis of your property as a result of a casualty loss or rebuilding your property in uh, a like new condition uh, <clears throat> adoption expenses that may be for adoption include expenses for altering your property to you uh, to a use that isn't consistent with the intended ordinary use of your property when you began renting the property so if you like converted your house into a restaurant or something like that then that's different and so you probably have to capitalize that so de minimis safe harbor for tangible property. If you elect this de minimis, so we got this small thing like this, like this small kind of exception thing. If you elect this de minimis safe harbor for your rental activity for the tax year, you aren't required to capitalize the de minimis cost of acquiring, producing certain real and tangible personal property and may deduct these amounts as rental expenses on line 19 of schedule E. So you're saying, okay, these might qualify for like an adoption or something these costs but they're pretty small so i don't think it's worth the, the time to do the more complex thing of having to capitalize them and then allocate them uh, because they're fairly small so is there a safe harbor due to that due to them being relatively small in dollar amount that i can just write them off as an expense which would be easy thing to do so that's that's that so for more information on electing and using the de minimis safe harbor for tangible property see chapter one publication 535 safe harbor for routine maintenance and so now you got the routine maintenance maintenance shouldn't be capitalized now you're going to expense it so you want to expense it that's usually what you want to do you don't really want to capitalize it if you determine that your cost was for an improvement on a building or equipment you may still be able to deduct your cost under the routine maintenance safe harbor you can see publication 535 for more information there the expenses you capitalize for improving your property can generally be depreciated as if the improvement were separate property